So it's now on to the good stuff. We are reading in reverse order tonight, so instead of Melissa Bank and Patricia McCormick, we're having Patricia McCormick and Melissa Bank. First up, Patricia McCormick. Well, it's really an honor to be reading with Melissa tonight, somebody whose work I really admire. I'll give you a little bit of background on the work that I do. I'm a young adult author, and my books are, one is about self-injury, one is about drug abuse, one is about child trafficking, and the one I'm gonna read tonight is about genocide. So they're pretty light, fluffy, <laughs> you know, beach read kind of thing. Um, my son always says, Mom, where do you come up with the ideas for these books? What do you do, Google the word sad? <laughs> So um, tonight I'm going to read to you from my most recent book. Uh, the title is Never Fall Down, and it's based on the true story of a man named Arnshorn Pond, who was 11 years old when the Khmer Rouge came to power in Cambodia. And he survived. Um, he survived by playing music, but honestly he survived by keeping his humanity intact, even as a child. Uh, he managed to be kind and steal food for other kids. He took terrible risks uh, on behalf of people that he grew to care for. And um, after the Khmer Rouge regime started to implode, uh, Vietnam invaded Cambodia. So he was forced to become a child soldier. And um, he had witnessed and participated in terrible atrocities before the invasion of Vietnam, but then once he was a soldier, um, worse was yet to come. So I'm gonna read both the first page, a couple little bites in the middle, and then I'm gonna read the last page because it is such a hard story to hear without hearing the ending. Okay. By the way, uh, the book is uh, written in Arn's voice. I spent months and months interviewing him so I could really hear how he sounds. And a lot of people have said that it's the voice of this kind of sweet 11-year-old that gets you through the worst of the story. Batambang, Cambodia, April 1975. At night in our town, it's music everywhere. Rich house, poor house, doesn't matter. Everyone has music. Radio, record player, eight-track cassette. Even the guys who pedal the rickshaw cycle, they tie a tiny radio to the handlebar and sing for the passenger. In my town, music is like air, always there. All the men, all the ladies stroll the park to catch the newest song. Cambodian love song, French love song, American rock and roll, like the Beatle, like Elvis, like Chubby Checker. Ladies in sarong walk so soft like floating. Men in trouser, hair slicked back, smoking lucky strike. The whole town is out at night. My little brother and me, we stand in front of the movie palace and sing for people. We do the twist also. Let's twist again like we did last summer. Two skinny kid, no shoe, torn pants. They like it if we sing for them. They even give us a few coin. Tonight, I study the crowd, find a lady, fat one, fat like milk fruit, and slowly, slowly, very sneaky. My brother and I, we hide behind her skirt, hold on so light she doesn't know, and pretend she's our mom. Kid with parent can see the movie for free. Kid like us, we pretend. Inside the movie palace, we watch America, black and white, with airplane, shiny car, women in skirt, so short they show the knee. War movie, lot of shooting, a little bit kissing. For the shooting, my brother and me, we clap. For the kissing, we hide our face in our shirt. After the show, it's the best part. When we do the movie ourselves, outside in the park, we fly the plane, shoot the gun, be the hero. Just like the real soldiers fighting outside, fighting right now in the jungle outside our town. We shoot probably a hundred bullet, die a hundred time. Then we hear a whistle and the sky flash white. The palm trees shiver and the ground shake. And all of a sudden, 
the war is real. I grab my little brother's hand and run and run till we get to a little pond near our house. We jump in, water up to our nose, and hide there where nothing bad can find us. So I'm going to jump ahead in the book. Um, the Khmer Rouge forced the entire population of Cambodia out into these labor camps in the countryside, death camps. And they separated children from their parents. They separated uh, siblings from each other. And Arn found that he was in a labor camp that was also a prison and execution camp. You, says one Khmer Rouge to me, you come with me. It's nighttime, other kids working in the fields, big torches burning so they can see. This guy says to me, different job for you tonight. He take me on one path, then another, then the path to the mango grove. Dusty path, so many feet walk down here on the way to die. All these days, I don't think of my aunt or my brother or sisters. Too dangerous to miss them and maybe cry or go crazy or just give up. But now I speak to them in my mind. I say goodbye. I say I will see them again someday because I know what this moment means. Already I can see the dirt pile, tall grass, very green, bones sticking out, leg, arm, skull, also pieces of cloth. Also I see a ditch and a line of people, maybe 15, maybe 20, all hands tied behind, kneeling, and high-ranking Khmer Rouge standing behind them. Then this guy, he take the ax, small ax like for chopping, and he hit one kneeling guy on the back of the head. The guy fall down, just like a pile of rag hitting the ground very fast. Then the Khmer Rouge, he go down the line, hit each one. Terrible sound, like cracking a coconut, only it's a human head. You, he says to me, you put them in the ditch. I don't want to do this, but I do it. My body does what this guy says. I push the people, very heavy, lot of blood. I push them into the grave. One guy, he's not even dead. They say to push him in anyway. Then the guy with the ax, he look at me, deep in the eye to see what I feel. I make my eye blank. You show you care, you die. You show fear, you die. You show nothing, maybe you live. One way to know how long we've been here, count the season. Eight harvests now mean two and a half years. Khmer Rouge give us new black clothes two or three times a year. Just one shirt, one pant. Just one, because no one can have any possession at all. No toy, no pillow, no bowl, not one thing. Another way to tell the time, how often they let us wash in the pond. Maybe one time every six weeks. Sometime the clothes smell bad, like shit and sweat, stiff from so much wearing. But sometime you have one hour to rest, and the Khmer Rouge say, OK, jump in the pond. Everybody at the same time, even the kid too weak. When I was a small boy, I liked to take off my clothes for swimming, jumping, doing a flip, throwing a leech at my little brother, a fun thing too dangerous to think of now. Here, they separate us for the bath, girl with girl, boy with boy. But my friend Ka, he says, we can see the girls, see naked girls, if we crawl under the building where we sleep. My friend Siv, he, he giggle and shut his eyes tight. Me, I cover my eye, but peek out between my finger. They timid these girl when they take off the black uniform. Nervous, I think, to show private thing, like breast, like bottom. But these girls, they are not like the Aspara dancer with round breast carved on the temple wall. They like old women, all bone, skin like paper, some with hair falling out. When the boys see this, we don't want to look anymore. When it's our turn, we play a little bit. Me and Ka and Siv, we pretend we like elephant 
making water come out our nose. Not crazy splashing, not crazy trick. Not enough energy in us to be crazy. If you're crazy, you drown. So we just play gentle with the water and maybe try to sink a little. Hold your nose, go down to the bottom, all dark and quiet. No blood smell, no loudspeaker music down there, no Khmer Rouge. But you can't sink yourself. You go down and you feel like you're floating again because nothing in your stomach. So uh, after Arn uh, escaped, he escaped from uh, his line as a soldier and he wandered in the jungle in Cambodia for about a month and found his way somehow to the Thai border. He was adopted by uh, an American there and brought to the United States, had a very difficult transition to New Hampshire where they put him in an all-white high school. He'd never been to school at all. And the kids there were really cruel to him. And he had in his mind these memories of his experiences with violence. And he was on the, on the brink of becoming very violent. He was also suicidal. And he described the feeling of having a tiger in his chest. And so this last page we'll leave you with um, is, takes place in 1984 at St. John the Divine, where Arne has been invited to speak about his experiences. And what he learns is that telling his story saves his, his soul. New York City, 1984. I swallow a big breath and start. My name is Arne, I say. I'm from Cambodia. Big speech I'm giving, my own speech. Long time I work on learning English. ABC every morning with Shirley, every day with Pat, the special teacher at school. But mostly I learn it on TV. Duke of Hazard, A-team. I learn it so much I even graduate New Hampshire High School. And now I get invited to speak at a big church in New York City, St. John the Divine at call, flowing with people, 10,000 people, with a lot of VIP, like guy named Desmond Tutu, and singer name of James Taylor, and guy from the New York Times. All waiting now for me to speak. I start very slow, very careful. I tell a little about my life before the Khmer Rouge, about doing the twist with my little brother, about catching frogs. Then I tell about how all the people have to leave the city, about the bodies at the side of the road, about being forced to leave my family, probably now all dead. And then the story pour out of me, about the kid dying from no food, the ax hitting the skull, the people calling to me from the grave. And then something happened. The paper I hold, big splash of water on it, the word dripping off the page, and my voice now, my careful American voice, it crack and break and die in my throat. Never have I cried, not one time all these years, from 11-year-old kid till now, not one tear. So many years, I think I'd kill off all the tear inside me. But after this long, dry season, now finally the rain. Nice man who introduced me, he come to my side, asked me if I want to stop. I say, no, I want to finish my speech. And now all the word come. They come not careful. They come with sob, my body shaking like a fever, with tear dripping off my nose, off my chin, my shirt, my collar, now all soaked through until finally I finish. A very great quiet now, a hush in this audience. Silence, like after we play music for the Khmer Rouge, waiting to see if we live, if we die. Then one applause, one more, then many, many hand, all together clapping. So much applause, like thunder, like the church, it roar from its bones. And oh, the sound, it lift me up, up high, like on top of a mountain. And I look out now, and I see all these people, American people, men and women, boy and girl, even the guy from the New York Times, all these people crying too. And finally, the tiger in my heart, 
he lay down a moment and rest. Thank you so much for coming. I know you're tired. It's that time in the conference where it's just, you're just tired. So thanks for walking here and sitting down. <laughs> I'm going to read a story from The Wonder Spot. Um, I don't think I've ever read it in public before, but it's called Run, 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 Run Away. When my brother tells me he's been seeing a psychiatrist, I say, that's great, Jack. He says, what, you think I'm fucked up? I say, how'd you find him? He says, what makes you think my psychiatrist is a man? Her name is Mary Pat Delmer, and Jack tells me she is brilliant. He says, she blows me away, and I think they must be talking a lot about junior high. When he tells me how beautiful she is, I say, but not so beautiful that you have trouble concentrating. She's pretty beautiful, he says, plus impressive. She won a scholarship to college, for example, and put herself through medical school. She grew up in rural Tennessee, where her parents still run a luncheonette. I say, she told you all that? Yeah, he says, why? I don't think of psychiatrists talking that much. <laughs> It's not until he breaks out laughing that I realize he's not in an analysis at all. Mary Pat is his new girlfriend. <laughs> I say very funny, though it is, in fact, very funny just to hear Jack laugh, as well as a huge relief. Our father died not even two months ago. My eggs and Jack's pancakes are set before us, and we stop talking to eat. We're at Homer's the diner around the corner from his apartment in the village. I ask how he met Mary Pat. He tells me Pete referred her. For a moment, Jack gets waylaid talking about the fishing shack he helped Pete restore this summer. Pete lives year round in Martha's, on Martha's Vineyard with his Newfoundland, Lila, who expresses her heartache by howling to Billy Holiday records. Doug, you don't know the trouble I seen. Jack says Pete called when MP moved to town. I think he's always been a little in love with her. I say nothing. I have always been a little in love with Pete. Though Jack didn't say he'd bring Mary Pat, I'm a little disappointed when he arrives at Homer's without her. Just coffee, he says to the waiter. He tells me that MP was mugged on her way home from work, and he was up half the night trying to calm her down. Jesus, I say, and ask where and when and was there a weapon? A knife, 10 p.m., a block from her apartment on Avenue D. I say, she lives on Avenue D? D is for drugs, D is for danger, D is for don't live on Avenue D unless you have to. <laughs> Jack says, it's what she can afford. I thought psychiatrists cleaned up, maybe in private practice, he says. As Dr. Delmer, Mary Pat treats survivors of torture in a program at NYU Hospital. From spending weeks at my father's bedside, I have become alive to a level of pain I'd never known. Now I feel it on every street of Manhattan, in every column in the newspaper, and just the idea of someone who works to ease suffering eases mine. Sounding like a worried mother, I say, she should take a cab when she works late. She says walking is her only exercise. When I arrive at the White Horse, Jack says, want to sit outside? It's November, I say, why would I want to sit outside? He tells me that MP will. After spending all day at the hospital, she craves fresh air. He takes off his leather jacket and hands it to me, an act of chivalry in the name of Mary Pat. I give in. You love this girl. He howls a mock forlorn, I do, imitating a country singer or Newfoundland. We maneuver our legs under a picnic table. We are the sole outsiders, and Jack has to go inside to get the waitress. We both order scotch for warmth. Jack yawns and tells me that he and Matt, Mary Pat were up most of the night discussing his new screenplay. He tells me that her notes are incredibly smart, unbelievably smart, smarter than his actual screenplay. 
It occurs to me that I have never heard him more sure of any woman and less sure of himself. He catches sight of his dramaturge across the street and I turn to look. She is tall and skinny in high heels. She has long wavy hair. Her cheeks are flushed and when she sees Jack, she smiles, activating dimples. Her hand is limp in mine, her voice shivery as she says, pleased to meet you. She kisses Jack full on the mouth and then says she thinks she's coming down with something. <laughs> Do we mind sitting outside? I mean, sitting inside. Once we're seated, I pretend, as I always do with Jack's girlfriend, that I already like her. I tell her that I can hardly sit in high heels, let alone walk in them, and how does she do it? I, I don't know, she says. Jack puts his hand across her forehead and her, his eyebrows slam up in worry. You have a fever. If you're sick, I say, we can have dinner another night. No, no, she says, I like a fever. <laughs> Her smile is wan, her skin shiny, you know, through the glass darkly. I do not know. I'm not even sure I've heard her correctly. Her voice is so quiet, I strain just for fragments. We pick up our menus. I'm going to have a cheeseburger and fries, I say. Jack says, same here. Mary Pat says, I don't think I can eat a whole one myself. You can share mine, he says. You don't mind? My brother, who usually slaps my hand if I take one of his fries, does not mind. <laughs> when our burgers arrive, Mary Pat ignores the extra plate brought for sharing and eats right off of Jack's. Instead of cutting the cheeseburger in half, she takes a bite and then he does. She even uses his napkin to wipe her mouth. I'm reminded of the aid organization, Doctors Without Borders. <laughs> Jack told me that you met through Pete, I say. Oh yes, she says, he warned your brother about me. And the two of them seem to think this is funny. I play along, ha ha ha, what did he say? Jack asks Mary Pat, what did he say? She says, I'm trouble. Her voice so lush with sex, I think, hey MP, I'm right here, Jack's little sister across the table. Her body reacts to the smallest shift in his. They are in constant bodily contact. She doesn't touch Jack directly, but rubs, against, rubs herself against him almost incidentally, like a cat. The one time he reaches for her hand, she lets him hold it for less than a minute, then she takes it back and hides it in the dark under the table. Maybe because of her whispery voice or her ethereal skinniness or her glass darkly fever, Mary Pat gives the impression of not quite being here at the table, here at the White Horse, here on Earth. <laughs> to assure myself of my own existence, I counter her quiet voice by raising mine, counter her little bites by taking big ones. I try to talk to her, but it is just me asking questions and her answering them. My questions get longer, her answers shorter. Still, I don't quit. I'm like a gambler who keeps thinking maybe the next hand. <laughs> the name of her parents' luncheonette? Delmer's. The division of labor, her father cooks, her mother serves. If I were at Delmer's now, we'd order meat and two. I say, meat and two? <laughs> One meat and two sides. I love sides. I ask which are best. <laughs> Butter beans, she says, grits, if you like grits. I nod the nod of a grits liker, <laughs> though not a single grit has ever entered my mouth. <laughs> I say, did you hang out at the luncheonette a lot growing up? Yes. I say, was it fun? No, she says, making clear that she doesn't want to talk about this or to talk to me or to talk. She says, excuse me, and goes to the ladies' room. What, I say to Jack. He says, she can't talk about her father. Were we talking about her father? <laughs> when she returns, Jack puts his arm around her. I say, I didn't mean to pry. Mary Pat says a wounded, don't worry about it. Jack does not call to ask what I think of Mary Pat, as he has with every other girlfriend he has ever introduced me to. He doesn't call at all. When I call him, he is in bed with a fever of 103. <laughs> I offer to bring him soup, and he says that he has soup and juice and everything he needs, left over from when he took care of Mary Pat. 
A week later, when I call to ask him for a meeting at Homer's, he's still in bed. He says that his fever is down. He just doesn't feel good. I say, what's the matter, buddy? Our father's nickname for Jack. She hated my revision. What? I told you she gave me notes on my script, he says. She said I didn't understand anything. I say, you want me to come over? Yeah, he says, and I go. His night table is a mess of drugs. NyQuil, DayQuil, Sudafed, Theraflu, a sticky dose cup, a, a, sorry, a, sick, a sticky dose cup, a mug, and a tea bag that looks like a mouse in rigor mortis. <laughs> His bed is covered with screenplay pages and used Kleenexes, which he says are of equal value to Mary Pat. Does she know that your father died nine weeks ago? He says, I asked her to be honest. It takes me a minute to understand that he is defending her against me. I clean up, I take his temperature, I make tea. I'm stirring soup when Mary Pat calls, apparently contrite. She's coming over, Jack says, which means I'm supposed to go. Jack arrives at Homer's blurry with exhaustion and hobbling. He tells me that he's been working out. I just overdid it, he says. I'm sorry, I just overdid it. He says something indecipherable through a yawn and up really late. I ask if he was working on his screenplay. No, he yawns. No, I yawn. We stayed up late talking, he says. Do you babies ever sleep through the night? He says, she was upset. I think of the work that Mary Pat does and the stories she must hear every day. I woke up, Jack says, and she was crying. I nod in sympathy. His voice is cloudy with sleep. She kept telling me how sorry she was. I say, why was she sorry? He seems suddenly to focus and to realize that he might not want to tell me this story. He hesitates before going on, but he does go on, too tired to obey his instincts. She's still in love with her old boyfriend. The words seem to spell out the end, and yet I don't hear the end in his voice or see the end in his face. I say, if she loves him so much, how come she broke up with him? I, wish, I watch Jack try to remember. She didn't feel she deserved to be happy back then. <laughs> What, come to, what comes to mind is Jack's rendition of the Talking Head song he changed from Psycho Killer to Psycho Babble and the refrain, run, 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 run away. I say, when didn't she deserve to be happy? Her freshman year, he says, he was a senior physics major. He played squash. I'm confused. So she's been seeing him since her freshman year? No, he says. She ran into him? No. But she wants to get back together with him? No, he says. He's married with two kids. <laughs> she doesn't even know where he lives. It occurs to me that I might understand this story better if I were really, really tired. <laughs> my, poor brother, my poor brother's eyes are tiny and his skin clam-colored. His hand trembles as he returns his coffee cup to the puddle in his saucer. He says, the good thing is, and drifts off. I say, the good thing is, she finally feels like she deserves to be happy. <laughs> Jack calls and says he wishes he hadn't told me about MP's old boyfriend. I say, I understand, and I do. There are things that two people say in the middle of the night that don't make sense to a third at breakfast. The next few times I ask, Jack tells me that Mary Pat is great, and then she is good, and then she is fine, and then she is okay. Saturday night at 4 a.m., he calls me from her apartment. I know without asking that he is sitting in the dark. I can hear it in his voice. I blew it, he says. I say, I'm sure you didn't. I did, he says, I blew it. How? I just blew it, he says, I blew it. Try to remember that we're having a conversation, I say, and your goal is to impart information. <laughs> he says, I should have proposed to her at the boathouse. When I don't answer, he says, in Central Park, as though to clarify, that was the perfect moment. I force myself to say the consoling words, I'm sure you'll have another perfect moment. No, he says, she said that was the perfect moment and we can never get it back. 
hold on there, I say. You've known each other for like 20 minutes. He doesn't answer, and I hear how irrelevant these words are to him. I'm worried that he's going to hang up and propose now. Just bear with me, I say. Forget about perfect moments for a minute. Do you really want Mary Pat to be your wife? You want Mary Pat to be the mother of your children? Yes, he says. I do not ask him if he thinks he would be happy with Mary Pat. Happiness, I realize, is beside the point. I realize, too, that he doesn't want to figure anything out or to feel better. He wants me to help him win Mary Pat. OK, I say, here's what I think you should do. Don't ask her to marry you. Give her room. Try not to need anything from her for a little while. How can I tell that I've said something he wants to hear? The silence is just the same, but I know. I imitate our father's calm authority. We'll figure the rest out in the morning. I've only called Pete a few times in my life, and as soon as I hear his hello, I remember why. He has settled in for the night, his feet by the fire, Dostoevsky in hand, Lila's head on his lap. A phone call is breaking and entering. We talk, but only about 1% of Pete comes to the phone. You get close to Pete by swimming or clamming or fishing, by weeding his garden or singing while he plays guitar. Every exchange is more strained than the last until I get to the emergency of my brother's love. When I finish, Pete says, I don't think there's anything you can do, Soph. He is sympathetic but resolute. I imagine this is the voice he uses to tell clients a house is beyond restoration. You don't understand, I say. I think he's going to propose to her. They all propose, he says. For myself, I say, did you propose? He laughs. No. It occurs to me that I have never known Pete to have a girlfriend. I say, how are you? You know, he says, OK. How's Lila? He says, how are you, Lila? What I hear in the moment of quiet that follows is Martha's vineyard in winter, the clouds in the sky, the wind on the beach, and the cold that stays on your clothes even inside. Jack does not return my calls. I ask my mother if she's heard from him. She has. She says, I can't wait to meet Mary Pat. I know how hard my little brother is working, and I'm reluctant to worry him. But when he asks me what I think of Mary Pat, I tell him everything. He's losing weight, I say. He doesn't sleep anymore. It occurs to me that this is how cults weaken the will of initiates. Robert says, it sounds like he's in love, and adds that the world's most coveted state is characterized by unrelieved insecurity and almost constant pain. The effect of his words is to remind me that it has been a long time since I have been in love. What about you, Robert says. Have you met anyone? He always asks, and I always have to say no, and I say no now. For the first time, he says he wants to introduce me to someone he knows, a pediatric heart surgeon. That's good, I say. I have a pediatric heart. <laughs> he says, don't talk about my sister that way. Before we hang up, I say, are you in love? No, he says. I ask if his wife knows. Of course, he says, Naomi's the one who told me. When Jack finally calls me at work, he says, can you meet me instead of hello? I say, when? He says, now, before I can ask where he hangs up. Even though it's 6 PM on a weekday, I assume Homer's, and I'm right. Jack's at the counter, his head bowed. His face looks haggard, but his body is surprisingly buff. He says that he can't sleep or eat or drink. Or, I'm sorry, he can't eat, sleep or eat or think or write. Apparently, you can work out, though, I say. She won't call me back, he says. I know how that feels. He misses the job. We had a fight, he says. About what? I'm sorry. We had a fight, he says. About what? It wasn't really a fight, he tells the waiter, just coffee. He'll have pancakes and bacon with that. To Jack, I say, or do you want eggs? I don't want anything, he says. I tell the waiter, he'll have the pancakes. Jack, Jack doesn't even seem to hear. You seem like you're in a coma, I say. And as soon as I say it, I feel sick. Our father was in a coma for days, and I've said coma the way people who don't know anything about it do, which is like calling out, can we get another coma over here? 
I say, I meant stupor, but Jack is in such a stupor he didn't even notice my coma. <laughs> when his pancakes come, he pushes the plate aside. He sighs and sighs again. His voice is so quiet, it's as though he's talking to himself when he says, I can't hit her. Sorry? I can't hit her, he says, and I realize how tired and desperate he must be to say these words to me. And you want to hit her. He shrugs. She wants me to. In bed, I say. Of course in bed, he says. Where else? Oh, I'm sorry, I say. Of course she wants you to hit her in bed, and you can't. Go on. <laughs> She thinks it means I don't love her. I say, can I hit her? <laughs> Sophie, his voice is a reprimand. Her father used to beat her. I think she probably deserved it. But then I turn back into a human being. My brother's face is so tired and so sad, it makes my face tired and sad. Buddy, but even as I say, if I were you, I'd try to get out of this thing. I know that nothing I say, no matter how wise or well put, will separate him from this woman. It's not like I have a choice, he says. I say, of course you do. She's been seeing someone else, he says, some guy she works with. I'm about to say a victim, but I correct myself in time. A survivor? He defends Mary Pat even now. She would never go out with a patient. There are so many things I could say about Mary Pat. I could call her the one word you say for occasions such as this, the only sacred profanity. But my brother loves this woman, whoever she is, and deriding her would only deride him for loving her. What else is there to say? I tell him that I've been editing a celebrity diet book at work. I say, newsflash, eat less, exercise more. When I slide the plate of pancakes in front of him, he says, I'm not hungry. Do you think I care if you're hungry, I say? This has nothing to do with hunger. Hunger is beside the point. Hunger is a luxury you can't afford. I pour syrup over the pancakes. When I cut into the stack, he says dryly, Lego my ego. <laughs> Repeating a commercial circa our childhood. You need a nap, I say. He eats one bite and then another. While he finishes his pancakes, I plan the future. I will walk him home and up the stairs to his apartment. He'll lie down. I'll shop for groceries. I will take him to a movie and out to dinner. In case my father is listening, I think we will look after each other. Thank you. Julie, you go. Hey, we have mics. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, you both have a very good sense of scene. Um, and I wanted to see if you would both talk about how you know what the arc of the smaller parts of your works are. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that's a really great question. I only ever try to write small scenes. Like when I sit down in the morning, I don't say, I'm going to write a book today. I think if I accomplish a scene, that's it. And I think it's like every story. It has to have a beginning, a middle, and end. It has to have that, that arc. And it also has to give you a springboard off into the next scene. Um, and I think it also has to play against expectations. Once, once you're in the heart of the story, if uh, you know what people are going for. If it's going to be sad and depressing, you got to turn it at the end with a little bit of humanity. Um, in my case, small lizards tell me what to do. <laughs> um, it's it is more along those lines. I mean, I'm not a, much of a planner, um, and I am trying to. Um, I'm trying to create something um, that I see and hear. And um, for me, it's a lot like writing down a dream. It, 
it sort of um, it sort of lasts as long as it lasts. And I feel like short stories are a little bit more like songs in a way that they have their own rhythms and melodies and, and I'm listening, the story tells me what to do. Like a small lizard. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Hi. Hi. I can't see you. It's Chloe. Hey Chloe, Hi. this is a student. <laughs> Of mine. I'm not allowed to speak until I have the mic. That I know. Oh yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. So this question is for Melissa. Um, I really loved um, the Girl's Guide to Hunting and Fishing, and um, I just had a question about the story right in the middle. I guess I've I've been curious um, how that was chosen because it does seem um, a bit different from the rest. It is different from the rest. And actually, if I were to write that book over, I would have another story that, um, that had more to do with that family. And I, I didn't really think about it that much. I just, I think for me, it, it's between two of the Archie's, the two Archie stories. And I almost, um, I almost wanted a kind of intermission because time passed. And, um, and, uh, and also, I think I wanted a break from that character, Jane, and, you know, wanted, wanted something else, and it seems sort of thematically in line enough, um, but it's the question I'm asked most. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, you're waiting for the mic. You know what to do. Uh, I would like Patty to tell us what happened when the subject of your book read the book that you wrote. Oh, great question. Um, he worked on the book with me along the way. He isn't uh, a very capable reader. So basically, we read it together. So we sat in my living room over a course of days, and I read it aloud to him. And it was really funny, because the book is a novel. There are passages and incidents that aren't true to the details of his life. There are things that he could not remember because they were so traumatic. Uh, so I would make things up. All he objected to was that I called mango trees mango trees instead of orange trees. It was, it was and he was very insistent on that point. He was shy. He felt uh, happy to have his life captured between the covers of a book. But I think he also felt uh, intimidated by the experience. He has changed, though. He used to do uh, public speaking as a way of making a living. And when he would go to speak about his experiences, he would become that 11-year-old all over again. He would cry. And it was really... Uh, problematic for him and it was it was uh, difficult for audiences to be to witness that kind of pain and I think he has been changed by having the story recorded in a book he's got a little distance on it now he sees himself as the man who survived all of that This is for Patty. Um, I wanted to ask you about sold and the format for it because I don't think it's actually described as a novel. At least the copy I have, there's, it's not the usual memoir slash novel slash whatever. So <clears throat> what is the form and how did you arrive at that form for that um, book? Sold is written in a series of vignettes. Some of them are a page and a half, some of them are two pages, some are one sentence. And uh, this is a book about child trafficking, and it's based on research that I did in the brothels in Calcutta. And when I came home, I was too depressed to really write. And um, it was Christmas time, and everybody was out shopping, and I thought, you know, what my family spends on wrapping paper, we could feed a family of four in Nepal. 
And um, my writing group said, well, you just have to put something out. Write one scene. Go where the energy is. We talked in my class about writing out of sequence. So I wrote a scene in the middle of the book just to, to disgorge it in a way. And it was only yay long. And then I wrote another one and another one. And ultimately, then I had several dozen of these little scenes. And I laid, printed them out, and I laid them on my living room floor. And I said, OK, they go like this. And there's a little space here. You need some connecting material. and I decided to use that as the format, that those vignettes, that white space between incidents, gives the reader a chance to catch your breath. It gives you, as the reader, a chance to fill in your own imaginings about the story. And I think it also reflects the kind of fragmented, chopped up experience that these girls have when they go from a little village in Nepal to um, a brothel. And I also find that young adult readers will follow you with almost any kind of format. And I think that short, crisp scene is easier to read if you have an attention span that's challenged by iPods and everything else. It, it's poetic. A lot of your language is, is more poetic than what I think of as typical. Did you make an effort to make it that way? I did. I really wanted to like play with my A game and, and make sure that every word counted. This question is also for Patty. I was wondering about the creative process with writing a character who you were interviewing versus a character that's fictional. How would you compare them? It's a big responsibility when it's a real person. I mean, the girls that I interviewed in the brothels, the mothers who inadvertently sold their daughters, they're real people too. Um, so I don't mean it that they were, it was different in that way. They gave me an enormous gift by sharing their stories with me. But I knew I was going to write a novel, and I knew it was going to be an amalgam of stories. So it wasn't one girl or one mother whose story I was telling. With Arne's story, he's a real human being who's become a very dear friend of mine. And I felt a heavy sense of responsibility to get it right. And you know what that did? That flattened the narrative. I felt such a, like I go, it was like I was going to the salt mines every day. And when I decided to kick him out of the room that, where I wrote and just be free with the story, being true to his life, but not feel like he was looking over my shoulder, that's when the book started to, to blossom. Um, the same question sort of to you, Melissa. When dealing with fiction and nonfiction, do you find that when you're, if you're keeping to nonfiction, do you find that it's, it's more difficult to get the story out, it, feeling that you have to adhere to the truth? Um, you know, I think one thing that's really hard about writing memoir, and this is sort of at the heart of writing memoir, is that the idea that it is, it has these new expectations of um, being structured and, you know, with an arc and, um, and having, using all of, you know, the tools of fiction. And, you know, memoir isn't fiction. And it's hard, I mean, I, 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 lately especially have been aware of the kind of falsification that it requires to write a good memoir in some ways. Or not falsification, I mean, I'm, I'm being a little bit too um, uptight, and, but, but there is something about it that bothers me. And lately, I do feel more comfortable in fiction. I feel like I have more freedom in fiction. And I don't feel, I don't feel as, um, I don't feel as self-conscious in fiction as I do in memoir. Is, does that answer your question? Anything else? Shy person or just? One more thing, a round of applause. Oh, thank you.